One, two, three, the lucky. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Lawn Feed Podcast. I am Andrew, your host for this episode, and joining me is Chris Ope, it's Mo Time, and a second time guest, we have Aaron Hathaway from New Farm, which we will introduce you to once again in just a moment. Thank you for tuning in to another great episode. We are talking about fungus once again, and we're diving in a little deeper than what we did on the previous episode. Last time we kind of just skimmed the surface and we're going to be diving in to a handful of specific uh, funguses like brown patch, dollar spot, gray leaf spot, pythium, maybe even more. We'll see where this conversation goes. Uh, Be sure to check out our website, thelawnfeed.com. We have premium t-shirts on there, including this brand new Lawn Dad t-shirt that I'm rocking right now. Stay tuned to the end of this episode. Maybe we'll give you a little discount to help sweeten the deal uh, to get yourself some lawn feed swag. Uh, Today we are talking with Aaron from New Farm. He is the technical service manager there. Uh, Thanks again for joining us, Aaron. We really appreciate you having on and sharing your knowledge with us. And then before we get into the nitty gritty of this fungus, let's hit on the dad's wins and losses. And as always, this segment is brought to you by Forefathers, a polo company elevating dad apparel for the DIY dad and the OG of that turf dad polo. Be sure to use the code the lawn feed for 20% off your entire order at shopforefathers.com. Aaron, win and loss. Why don't you give it to us, man? All right. Thanks, guys. Um, so my win, uh, I actually, I just asked my eight-year-old uh, an hour ago if he had me dad wins for me and he told me that a win at least in his eyes was that i watched all of the nba finals games with him um he states that he's an nba fan he didn't watch all of the games with me i promise you that but i did watch at least portions of them with him and so he said that was a win so i'll take it so that was a win the loss the loss i'm actually nervous about sharing (laughs) just because um it's like sens- sensitive subject, but the lo- <laughs> the loss was happened a long time ago. My daughter's 18 year old, 18 years old right now. She was three when this happened, so she was like preschool, and um, she went to a daycare. And you know, I don't know if you do know, but if you don't, this is what happens at daycares often. If it's like Father's Day, they have all the little kids fill out like, "What does your dad like to do on Saturday?" <laughs> What does yeah. your dad like to drink? What's his favorite food? And so um, there were two questions in particular that when I got there and picked her up, the daycare um, teachers had to show me the answers to her questions. And and so again, she was three. <laughs> the first question was that was hilarious or embarrassing for me was, um, what does your dad like to watch on TV? And her answer was adult movies. <laughs> and so her oh, idea no. of adult movies is anytime we're watching a movie obviously we say no this isn't for you this is for adults and so she said that <laughs> i like to watch adult movies <laughs> the teachers were cracking up they obviously knew uh <laughs> i hope they knew that it wasn't actual adult movies and then the other one was it kind of goes with it i guess is what what does your dad like to drink and uh, her answer was beer so um yeah. I like to watch adult movies and drink beer. Just the standard dad, you know, pretty much li- lifestyle. Yeah. I yeah. think those, those kind of things are <clears throat> hilarious. I think that's kind of happened to a lot of dads and moms out there when they fill out those little questionnaires, like yeah. these kids say the darnest things and they don't realize what they're saying. And <laughs> no. it is just, it is just, it's like a, filling out a Mad Lib or whatever those, those, those things are called with random words. It just sure. turns into the funniest thing. And you immediately but, feel like you got to explain yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's and like they're how, totally used to it. Yep. How many times am I going to get reported to CPS this week? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no so doubt. Let's just, let's find it out. So uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, so Aaron, obviously, welcome back. Uh, you, you've been on our show before. Um, and for our listeners, give us a quick intro of who you are, what you do for New Farm, 
um, before we really get into the, you know, the disease category real quick. Okay. So um, you already mentioned, I'm a technical services manager for, for New Farm. New Farm is a company that produces um, pesticides. So not only for agronomy, but also for turf and ornamentals. And I am a technical services manager in turf and ornamentals. So I provide kind of like the technical overview for our sales staff and our marketing staff, um, our regulatory team. So all of the technical stuff um, I talk about um, kind of comes stems from a lot of the work that I did when I was at MSU before I worked for New Farm at Michigan State University. I did tons of research uh, with uh, weed control, PGRs. I did some fungal stuff as well, so disease control. So a lot of that, and it kind of carried over to my job uh, at New Farm. So. A lot of what I do is um, research. It's research oriented, really. I, I send out a ton of research to universities and they're looking at different products, uh, comparing them to other products, comparing them to doing nothing at all. And so I get to, I get to see a lot of these um, different, her whether it's a herbicide or a fungicide or an insecticide, I get to see a lot of them head to head. So for me, that's really fun. That's uh, the, the most exciting part of my job is the research part of it. So. I'm headlong into that right now. Which indirectly or directly uh, makes all of our lives easier because it's advancing and in, in evolving what is currently on the market, um, which is great and, and, and cultural practices and things like that. So we're going to be talking about a lot of different uh, diseases and fungi and all of those different things. Um, but keeping it very elementary, high level, uh, there's a couple different forms of you know, d diseases, right? There's root born and foliar born. Can you just give high level kind of w what each of those mean? And then we'll start diving into kind of these diseases step by step. So homeowners can, you know, get some help, maybe identifying what's going on in their lawn right now. Yeah. So, um, a lot of the diseases that we see in, in turf grass that affect turf grass are caused by pathogens, right? Same so some of the same path pathogens are at least similar to pathogens that affect us. So I always mm -hmm. tell people, you know, it's not too different from some of the pathogens that might cause like athlete's foot. Um, almost every pathogen that we see in turf grass is a, is a fungi. So it's a, a fungus of some sort that's affecting the turf grass and, and affecting the health of it. But of course there's nuanced differences between these fungi that we find, um, in the turf, whether it's on the foliage of the turf, turf or in the thatch or in the soil. And so you mentioned there's some soil borne pathogens, um, pathogens that kind of reside in the soil. And those tend, not always, but tend to affect the roots more than the shoots and the leaves of the plants. And then we have a lot of foliar pathogens as well that affect um, the leaves of the turf and, and so in, in the foliar pathogens, often you see those symptoms on the leaves and on the shoots of the turf. Um, for the soil borne pathogens, it's, it's even more difficult. You don't always see the symptoms in the roots. What you'll tend to see are the symptoms in the turf above the ground way after it's all done. When your turf is dead, that's when you see it. And so those mm -hmm. tend to be really, really destructive. Um, not always more than the foliar pathogens, but sometimes can be. Well, anybody who's listening to this episode, uh, if you didn't know, we are also on video and we post this on our YouTube channel. And Aaron is kind enough to provide us with a lot of detailed pictures of all these different fungi and diseases that we will be talking about in this episode. So if you are listening um, on the go, this might be one of those episodes that you might want to hop onto YouTube at a later time and check out some of these pictures. Uh, as a reference. So just throwing that out there. Uh, now let's get into it. Uh, fungus is an issue that even with good cultural practices, I think just about anybody is going to um, see it in their lawn, golf courses, even the best turfs out there experience it, um, even with preventatives. But uh, Aaron, can you help us by, I think, identify, let's start with brown patch. Um, what is brown patch and how do you go ab about identifying it from other funguses? Yeah, so um, when, anytime we talk about a, a fungus in the turf or a disease, I mean, we can call it a disease, right? We don't have to get too uh, technical if that's technical, but 
you always have to think about, and if you listen to anybody talk about diseases in turf grass, you'll always hear this. It's called the disease triangle. Have you guys heard mm -hmm. the disease mm -hmm. triangle? So you'll always hear it from everybody, but it really is, um, I'm not just bringing it up because you, because everybody else brings it up. It really is important because it brings in all the, the three aspects that are going to, that are going to cause a disease event. And the first thing, at least in my mind, is the host. And so certain diseases attack certain hosts. Not every disease will attack every host out there. And by host, we're talking about a turf grass species. And so uh, you mentioned brown patch. The first thing that pops into my head when you say brown patch is tall fescue. Tall fescue is a, um, I remember 20 years ago, it was really a new up and coming turf species. It wasn't really all that popular. And so over the last 20 years, it's become really, really popular, especially in the transition zone as you move. I'm in Michigan. So as you move further south from me, and really even in Michigan, it's becoming more and more popular. And so we tend to find things out about certain turf species once we start to plant them everywhere. And um, we found certain things about it, out about tall fescue. And then you start to um, change the genetics of that tall fescue and come up with different cultivars that maybe are, are more tolerant to certain diseases. And the major disease on tall fescue is, is um, tall fescue by far. That's number one. Number two, I would say, is gray leaf spot. But tall fescue, so that's the host. The host would be tall fescue. So if you have tall fescue, brown patch should be on your radar. If you don't mm -hmm. know what turf species you have, um, I mean, that could be another episode. <laughs> we could talk about how to determine what species you have, and then it would really help you to determine what diseases you might, might expect. So the host is first part of that disease triangle. The disease pathogen is the second part, and we already talked about brown patch is caused by Razak. Rhizactonia of solani. That's just a pathogen. It's a fungus that attacks tall fescue and other species as well, but tall fescue is a big one. And then the, the third portion of that disease triangle, there's three points, is the environment. And so um, if you think about a fungus, like if you guys think about athlete's foot, which is a fungus, um, I hope moisture comes into your mind. I mean, people who get athlete's foot, it's named athlete's foot for a reason. They're athletes, they're often wearing shoes forever and playing and sweating in them. And so that moisture develops and uh, fungi tend to just thrive in, in moisture. So diseases like brown patch, dollar spot, so many of the diseases we're gonna talk about, they thrive when moisture is high. And we're gonna talk about something uh, like leaf wetness. It's periods of leaf wetness. And the longer period of time that the leaves are wet on a turf grass, the better chance you have of growing a fungus and that fungus causing symptoms in the plant. The, the other big part of the environment that affects the growth of these pathogens too is, is um, uh, temperature. So in high heat, that's when brown patch really tends to thrive is in high heat. So high humidity, high heat, that's when brown patch goes crazy. So host, um, the pathogen and the environment, those three, three things really, um, when you put them together, that's when you're going to have a disease event. In the in the when we're talking about brand, brown patch in particular, obviously if, if the host is there, and we, we were talking about tall fescue, so we'll stick with that. If tall fescue is your turf grass species, you can be sure that the pathogen is somewhere, um, and it'll move around through. Certain pathogens will move by spores. Certain pathogens will move with water, but they move around pretty quickly. And so that pathogen will make its way to that host eventually. And then if, and then really your goal as a, as a homeowner, somebody who's overseeing a lawn, is to kind of keep tabs on that environment and learn those cues that are gonna tell you, man, it's getting pretty humid, it's getting pretty hot, I should start looking out for brown patch or I should make an application and preemptively knock down the inoculum that's gonna start growing that pathogen and affect my turf. Um, Brown patch, uh, like the name indicates, it tends to form these patches in the turf. There's a lot of patchy diseases in turf, so a patch doesn't necessarily tell you anything. And so I would say that when you're going to identify a, a turf grass disease, the host really tells you almost the most, it tells you the most out of anything. You can go and you can inspect a leaf really carefully but if you just know your host and then what diseases affect your host, you can cancel out a bunch of other mm -hmm. diseases 
that aren't going to affect your your host. And so, you know, we could sit here and talk about what the what the how big the patches are and what lesions you might sound, see on the leaf. And you will see lesions. You'll see these little um, little lesions on the leaf that are just chlorotic or necrotic little lesions that are browned out in the green turf with a uh, a region on the outside that's browned out. So. But the, the name comes from that brown patch. You'll, you'll go on your yard and you'll see brown patches. That doesn't necessarily mean it's dead, but um, that's how you'll see it. And if you've ever encountered brown patch, it's a pretty good name for it. Now, for, I was going to ask real ahead. quick. Is, uh, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, is brown patch something that will actually kill my grass? Or mm -hmm. is it something that, you know, the, it'll run its course and it'll be fine in the fall, following spring? Yep. So brown patch can certainly kill your turf grass. Um, when we're talking, when we, brown patch can infect uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Um, I mean, it, when you're on the golf course, it can infect uh, creeping bent grass ryegrass it can infect as well and so there's a, a bunch of different species it can infect it just so happens that tall fescue is just one of the main ones um, that we see but it can certainly in those patches where you see them brown out especially from the center out and pathogens tend to grow like that when you see if you go and you look up um, fungi on the internet you'll see people plating them out in petri dishes and they grow from the center out so they'll plate them They'll put the fungus in the center of the plate, and then it will grow from the center of the plate out. The same thing happens in turf. So if it infects a turf grass plant here, that infection tends to grow in these patches. And that's why you see these patches. And especially at the center of that patch and out, you can certainly see dead turf in patches all around. And so I've seen it in tall fescue all the time, where if you just leave it unchecked, um, you'll have big dead patches of, of, of turf and tall fescue, other species as well, if you don't do anything. Even if you do do something, if the symptoms are there, it means that the pathogen's been growing for a long time. It's been growing, and now the turf has finally succumbed to it. Um, and so it could have been, quote unquote, dying for a long time. So it can certainly tilt, kill some turf. Tall fescue is a really resilient turf grass species, has deep roots, so it can... Um, I might say that it can kill some turf and there might be plants within that stand that it did kill, but there's enough plants also within the stand to push up new turf and then tiller out and fill in that spot over time. So um, yes, it can kill turf, but often turf can over time, you know, over a year's period, it could recover as well. If a homeowner notices this, how would they go in and treat it? So if they see the first signs of tall fescue, uh, I'm sorry, of brown patch, say they have tall fescue as a turf species and they see the first signs of, of brown patch and the first signs would be on their leaf blades, they would see small, very small lesions. So you could go out there and it might just look like some flecks of just chlorotic turf. And by chlorotic, I just mean some yellowing, some browning out of the turf. Then you would go and you, you could pull up and I'll show some pictures of this. You, they can look at individual turf leaves and they'll see these small lesions on the leaves. If they see those lesions, they should know that a fungus is involved. They should know if, it, if they know it's tall fescue, that's likely brown patch. If it's been humid, if it's been hot, if all these things come together, then brown patch should be on the radar and they can certainly go and spray a fungicide. That's one good way to kind of just check. We, we call it inoculum. It's, it's, the pathogen, it, um, like I said, it'll grow. It'll keep growing until those conditions disappear. And once the humidity and the heat disappears, then it can stop growing or at least slow the growing. But as long as those conditions are in place, it'll continue to grow. It'll continue to cause those symptoms in the plant. And so um, they can spray a fungicide. Um, other than that, there isn't a ton that they can do. They can reduce irrigation. They can try to reduce the amount of leaf wetness that will be there so that the pathogen has a tougher time growing. Um, even putting down less nitrogen in times where you might see high, do or high brown patch incidence, less nitrogen, just because nitrogen causes new growth. New growth can be very succulent, can be um, 
less tolerant to disease like brown patch. So a little bit less nitrogen during those times. But I say that, but at the same time, you want healthy turf grass. So you don't want to mm-hmm. withhold it by any means. So it is, it's one of those times where if the disease is present, you don't have, there isn't a ton that you can do besides a spraying a fungicide that will halt it in its place. Nothing else is really just going to halt it unless the weather changes. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, that's going to be a repetitive answer for, I think, you know, a couple of these, right, coming coming on the pipeline. But, you know, in to recap what he just said, it's there are things that you can do if you see something in your yard. Your entire yard is not going to die. Um, you know, I want to say that early on before we get on to the other ones. Uh, there are things that you can go do to prevent them. And sometimes the answer is not to go throw a whole bunch of fertilizer down, right? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> especially with newer turf. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into, you know, some of the other ones. But uh, but do- so dollar spot, uh, moving on from brown patch, dollar spot's a, a different one. Uh, where would that be most common in, in terms of turf grasses? Uh, so, how do you, how do you ID it? And then what would you do to prevent it? Okay. So we talked about brown patch dollar spot is, is, um, a disease that I think is probably the most ubiquitous disease. It affects probably, I'm not sure there's a turf grass species that it won't affect. And so, but Kentucky bluegrass is a big one. Um, if you're in the South Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, it'll affect those. Um, bent grass on golf courses, fine fescue. It will affect tall fescue, but not to the extent that um, that brown patch will. So pretty much every species out there, dollar spot will attack. Um, dollar spot, like brown patch, is another fungus. Um, dollar spot will grow in the thatch. And so this is one where, so let's talk about ID first. Um, mm-hmm. It's one where you'll also see lesions very similar to brown patch. You'll see these circular lesions. If you pick out one leaf from a stand of turf and so dollar spot, just like brown patch, brown patch, I would say, especially in, in uh, lawns mode at like three inches, the taller they're mowed, the bigger the patches will be. So you could mm-hmm. have easily one, two foot, three foot patches sometimes in tall fescue. Um, dollar spot is going to be smaller. Um, hence the name spot. <laughs> they don't, they don't, um, the names do a pretty good job. I think of describing the diseases sometimes on a golf course, they're the size of a silver dollar. And I think that's really where the name comes from, but we don't tend to see that in our lawns on a golf course, because fairways are mowed at, at, you know, half an inch or even lower greens are mowed at an eighth of an inch or even lower. So those spots tend to be like a quarter or a half dollar size. Once you get to a lawn, it's more like, um, I don't know, maybe four to six inches in diameter, those spots. And so you'll see them in spots. And if you start to see those spots, uh, again, I encourage you to go out and pick a leaf, especially on the edge of the uh, necrotic leaves. When I say necrotic, I mean like void of any green tissue. The tissue is dead. It's necrotic. It's dead. And so go to the edge of those spots and pick out some, uh, some leaves and look for lesions, actual smaller lesions on the leaves themselves. And so you'll actually have to pick out leaves. You'll, sometimes you'll get on your hands and knees. Diseases is one where you really have to get down and look into the turf and actually get on the edge of the, the just because some tissue is dead doesn't mean the plants are dead by any means. The, the mm-hmm. roots can still be living. But get on the edge of the dead tissue and look for some tissue that is just being affected. And you'll see lesions. If it's dollar spot, you'll see lesions on the leaves. And dollar spot does something, and we start to describe these lesions in very in meticulous detail when we start to differentiate between these diseases. Dollar spot will cause an hourglass lesion. So if the lesion crosses from one end of the leaf to the other, um, and I'll show you a picture of this as well, that lesion will cause that leaf to shrink in where that lesion is and cause this dollar spot or this hourglass shape. Sorry. Mm -hmm. If you see that hourglass shape, it's almost a dead ringer. It's a dead ringer for dollar spot. It's not something you see with brown patch. It's not something you see with gray leaf spot. And so that's something that you'll find with dollar spot almost um, with that particular pathogen uh, in particular. So 
Look for that hourglass and you might have to look around, look around for a couple of them because some of the lesions will look really similar to brown patch lesions or even gray leaf spot lesions. But if you find that hourglass shape in some mm -hmm. of those leaves, that's, that's a helpful sign. Um, same as brown patch, similar to gray leaf spot, dollar spot thrives in moist conditions. So when we always say when you have dew that sits on the, on the ground and doesn't dry up from the hot sun for a long, long time, when we have those dew periods that last a long time. So if you have 10 hours of dew cover on your lawn, man, you're waiting for fungus to start growing. Look, start looking for things like dollar spot. Um, also, you know, some of the warmth can help it grow as well. We also tend to see in, in cool season turf, we tend to see dollar spot in the um, fall of the season, sometimes mm -hmm. in the spring, but I tend to see it more in the fall of the season because we get those heavy dew points and we get a ton of dew that lasts late into the day. And so the leaf wetness is there for sometimes 10, even if you get 14 hours of leaf wetness on, on turf, you're asking for disease. You're almost guaranteed to have some kind of disease. And then I was in the about, fall, yeah, I, was about to, I was about to ask that because I, I, had, I had some issues with that last year, um, but I noticed it in the fall. Okay. And I, because no, normally, like you think fungus and disease, you think these hot summer months because of that 150 rule. Yep. right or, or or getting close to that but you can get fungus and problems all the way until the fall because yes. of the same environmental problems right 100 percent. you know yeah, so you just mentioned the 150 rule and so, so spin martin from pro turf talks taught us about that on a previous episode okay we've got we've we've talked about it multiple times on here so i'm not going to go over that right now but um he's also like we're talking about the dew he he told us um, if you have in-ground irrigation and it takes, you know, three minutes for that sprinkler to go around and hit everywhere in your yard, he said, turn it on for just long enough for it to run around one time every morning at like three, 4 a.m. Because that actually knocks the dew off and it'll help the leaves dry out faster. So I thought that was a pretty cool tip that he gave us. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good tip. The other thing that, I mean, even beyond dew, there's something called gutation water. So... Um, the turf releases some moisture as well. Obviously, the, the turf is trans, transpiring, so it's pushing moisture through the vascular system, and it pushes out glutation water. And in glutation water from the turf itself is sugar as well, which also can feed the fungus. So you can also mm -hmm. knock that off the plant. And so um, that's why one of the reasons why you'll hear a lot of people suggest that you run irrigation early in the morning, so 4 or 5 a.m., so that you're knocking the dew off and, and that irrigation that you run, some people might think, well, you're increasing the moisture in the turf grass plant. Well, um, maybe if there was no moisture there at all, then you're increasing it, but there's already a ton of moisture that really just kind of fell down and settled on the turf grass and that gutation water pushes out of the plant. And so if you can come around with some bigger droplets that just splash it off the plant, that's really what you're doing and, and you can can really help yourself out, especially with a disease like dollar spot that thrives with, um, you know, a lot of them thrive with high humidity, high um, long periods of leaf wetness. But dollar spot, especially in the fall, like you mentioned, the, the sun angles, at a, you know, it's much more steep so that it's not drying out as quickly in the fall. So if you start to think about all these aspects that aspects that might increase that leaf wetness, that's really what you're trying to avoid. And if you can avoid it, then don't be surprised when you start to see a fungus start to grow and, and affect your turf grass. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, gray leaf spot. Let's talk about that one. How do we ID it? What is it, what is it prevalent in or what is it common in? And is there anything we can do to prevent it? Yeah. So gray leaf spot. Um, <clears throat> gray, so I'm in Michigan. And I can't say that I really see gray leaf spot almost ever. Maybe, maybe I've seen it here and there, but gray leaf spot tends to thrive in just really hot weather. And gray mm -hmm. leaf spot is one that can come in and just take out a whole. So we talked about brown patches, uh, brown patch, which can certainly kill patches of turf. Like I said, if you have a tall fescue lawn, you could come out after, if you ignored it for a while, you could come out and you could have some patches of turf that are dead. 
but there might still be some leaves in there or plants in there that survive and fill it in carefully, slowly over time. Dollar spot, same thing. You're gonna be hard pressed to just kill an entire lawn with dollar spot. Um, you'll have enough plants that survive and fill in over time, especially if you do all the cultural practices that help that along. Gray leaf spot's one that can come in and devastate a lawn just um, almost overnight. And so um, I'll share like gray leaf spot's one that I've heard, um, say you're in North Carolina, there's a hurricane. That hurricane comes in, it brings in moisture, brings in humidity, right? And then on top of that, you don't mow your lawn for a week because that hurricane just kind of just came through. You huddled down inside. Um, maybe it threw down some, some tree limbs, things like that. So you just didn't get to your lawn. It was the last thing you thought about. Those are the situations. It's in those, it's honestly, it's when uh, we have um, things like hurricanes that come through that we hear most about gray leaf spot. When the lawn gets so tall that the humidity within that turf just is so high for such a prolonged period of time, that gray leaf spot just goes crazy. And gray leaf spot, like I said, can devastate a lawn pretty pretty quickly. The turf species that you're really looking for gray leaf spot on are perennial ryegrass, number one. It can crush perennial ryegrass. So perennial ryegrass, you're thinking about two diseases in particular. It's gray leaf spot and it's pythium, pythium blight. Tall fescue though, um, and again, tall fescue has really only been around for 20 years, at least in my opinion, as a common turf grass species. We didn't know that it was so um, intolerant to gray leaf spot until, at least I didn't know, um, until maybe the last 10 years. And so gray leaf spot can devastate tall fescue, especially in the transition zone. St. Augustine grass, so if you're in Florida or um, Texas Panhandle or something, uh, St. Augustine grass can be really intolerant of gray leaf spot. So gray leaf spot can come in and devastate turf as well. And it's the same thing. We talk about brown patch, so big patches, dollar spot, smaller patches or spots. Gray leaf spot can start out as, as spots. And also you're going to find lesions on leaves. And I, I can tell you one thing you can look for for gray leaf spot um, is if you pick up some of those leaves, it's the... Um, margin around the lesions. So now we're talking about even very particular looking lesions in the margins around them. The margins around the lesions tend to look even more purplish. They have a, mm. a purple tint to them. So that's something you can look for. But if you put that together with perennial ryegrass and tall fescue, that's something you can really look for. And again, it's the same thing. 14 hours of leaf wetness. And if you have tall fescue or perennial ryegrass, you're further south and it's hot you're looking for gray leaf spot for sure. Um, so yeah. with that, so with the, with, with like the regions there, is that, that's not to say a quote unquote cool season state couldn't get that. Mm -hmm. um, Cause there are periods where we get steaming and hot. It's just way less common. Yeah. So gray leaf spots an interesting one because I don't think we know for sure, but I, I believe that the theory is, is that spores will come up from the south. Spores will survive more in the south uh, regions of the United States, uh, much like fall armyworm. Uh, if mm -hmm. you've heard of fall armyworm, they're coming from, they're marching north from the south slowly but surely. And so um, I don't, like I said, I don't think we know this for sure, but I think we theorize that these spores are coming up from the south and they don't make it all the way north, which is why maybe Michigan and Minnesota and Wisconsin, we just don't see it as much. It doesn't have enough time to incubate up here and, and cause mass chaos like it can further south. And it can, for sure. So there are benefits for freezing our tail off for six mm -hmm. months out of the year. And that's oh, one of them. Of them yeah. <laughs> no for army sure. worms and no gray yeah, right. spot. Yeah. <laughs> now these three uh, foliar funguses that we have just discussed, um, obviously good cultural practices are a good way to prevent, you know, them from popping up, you know, mm -hmm. just some things are out of your control. Um, I think maybe mentioning bagging your clippings while mowing um, is probably a good thing to do uh, just because since this all is on the blade, if you just sling those blades all over your lawn to your healthy grass, you're just promoting spreading. Um, now you mentioned some of the treatments, you said fungicides, uh, is there a specific fungicide, uh, like active ingredients that you recommend 
like four of these um, three foliar fun, uh, funguses, for, both for preventative and for curative. Uh, is there any that work better than others? Yep. So let's let's just go. Let's talk about preventative versus curative first off sure. the bat. So um, let's talk about Dollar Spot real quick. Like you mentioned, Dollar Spot is a um, it produces mycelium. It's like uh, the structure that it will produce and grow. And so as you mow, you can move that mycelium through the through the turf thatch and through the turf. And so you'll almost see it kind of move in patterns with mowing patterns because you'll move the the vegetative structures, that mycelium that it produces. And so you'll see that with something like Dollar Spot. And so this mycelium, it, it will be dormant in kind of the thatch of the turf. And then when the conditions are right, it'll start growing, it'll infect turf, it'll cause this infection, and then you'll see the symptoms. Every time, if you see symptoms, it means you're late to the party. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's not really a helpful statement to the normal homeowner because just like me, like I'm not thinking about turf pathogens all the time. Like, oh, it's humid and it's it's warm. I'm I bet this turf pathogen is probably growing. I'm going to go spray something. That's not how I think. So I I get that that's easy for me to say and it doesn't really mean anything. But if you can start training yourself to one, what species do you have? Is it Kentucky bluegrass? Then then Dollar Spot should be on your radar. Really, any species Dollar Spot should be on your radar at least somewhat. Um, but if you saw it one year, if I saw Dollar Spot in my lawn one year and I was able to positively identify it as Dollar Spot, then um, then I'd go look it up. Maybe I'd Google it and I'd say, okay, Dollar Spot, I saw it one year. There's potential at least for me to see it the next year. If it's brown patch, if I have tall fescue and I see brown patch, I positively ID it. Or if it's gray leaf spot, whatever it is, I could Google it. Maybe I watch this and I figure it out. I should at least have some expectation that it could return, right? That pathogen is probably surviving somewhere. If it's, we just talked about gray leaf spot, maybe it's making its way further north from, from down south, but eventually it will get there just like it did the year before. If I see a disease one time, then I should at least have some expectation that I could see it again. And so that on its own, to me, gives you some indication of, okay, maybe I should do things a little bit differently. So just as we mentioned, some of the cultural practices can be key. Watering early in the morning, knocking off some of that gutation water, some of that dew that may have set on your turf, so that leaf wetness is a shorter period of time. That's key, really is key. Um, leaf wetness, I think, is the biggest one. If you can, whatever you do, reduce the leaf wetness on a golf course, they'll go out with a dew whip and they'll knock the dew off of greens and even fairways. They'll drag a hose between two carts over fairways just mm -hmm. to knock the dew off. The only reason they ever do that is to reduce the possibility that a pathogen is able to grow um, on that turf. And on those, those days, they're probably not mowing. And so whatever it is, maybe you come up with your own way to knock off dew or, or to reduce leaf wetness. Um, maybe you have a bunch of trees and it's really difficult to do. Maybe your only resort is there's no way I'm gonna reduce the leaf wetness period I've got to spray a fungicide. And I'm not saying everybody needs to. Certainly these diseases don't necessarily always devastate the lawn, but a fungicide is, it, it's a good tool, right? So it's a tool in the, in the toolbox and it's, it's a good one for certain, certain situations. And so um, I say all that just because you don't want to wait to see the symptoms before you do something about it because it's too late. So that was maybe a long way to say that but you mentioned fungicides. And so that pathogen, it's often, as I, I started with Dollar Spot, that pathogen's residing in that thatch, in the thatch of the turf. I can go a spray and spray a fungicide way before you would ever see symptoms. I'm in Michigan, right when turf greens up, say it's May 1st, I could go a spray a fungicide and I could knock down the inoculum. I could really um, kill a bunch of the inoculum that was already in the turf. And we've done research over and over and over again that shows when you knock down the inoculum early before you see any symptoms or have any idea that the pathogen could be infecting the turf, you can get way ahead of the game. And so it doesn't cure everything, but it gives you a ton of extra time before you might see a, a pathogen really affecting a turf to the point that you're seeing pretty bad symptoms. And so 
all that to say that if if you have a lawn where you you're always seeing a fungus attack your turf grass species whatever it is uh, at some point during the year you can spray a fungicide before you even see the fungus you really can and that might even be the best way to go about it because that's the point you want to kill it before it causes the symptoms to be seen you can certainly go out curatively and spray as well um, but the the effects are always less preventative is always better so um i'll i'll start with that but i don't know if you guys had anything to add or questions or whatever um so in the diy community i know there's a lot more fungicides available to people that like work on golf courses and mm -hmm. stuff we see azoxystrobin and propiconazole as the common two that are easy to get your hands on are those effective for all these that we have talked about so far for so, both curative and preventative and what he means is scott's disease x well scott's disease x but you could also go on like well you know online and buy if you want to spray yeah. and stuff yeah. too but like if you go to the big box stores they make you know they have propiconazole and the hose on sprayer that you can mm -hmm. get or granular as well so yeah okay so when you get into the nitty-gritty of the the particular uh fungicides out there propiconazole is, is a part of a, a chemistry class called the dmis um and the dmis are really cool fungicides because they're very broad spectrum so they can really affect a ton of different fungi out there so propiconazole is popular in in lawns for a good reason because it's just really uh, broad spectrum um so propiconazole is a good one azaxystrobin uh, for the lawn diseases out there is really good. It's good on, on gray leaf spot. It's good on brown patch. It's not great on dollar spot. So I would say it's um, squeaky wheel is probably dollar spot. Propiconazole picks up dollar spot. Mm. So if you, know, if you start to mix the two, you can probably just get everything under the sun. Once you start to mix different classes of, of fungicides together, you can really get broad spectrum control. And so, you know, I work for... Um, New Farm, we make, we make a product called Turney, and you can it can be used in residential turf. Not every fungicide is labeled for residential turf, so that's one big key to look for. You can't just go and buy, um, you know, there's one called Fluazinam that's really popular in golf, but it's not labeled for any use in, in residential turf. So you, you really do have to um, know which ones are labeled, but there's plenty labeled. But Turney that we make, which is metconazole, it's another DMI, just really broad spectrum pretty good on gray leaf spot, really good on dollar spot, really good on brown patch. So it gets a lot of them out there just in one, one fell swoop. And then there are kind of what I would say are specialists, um, like thiophanate methyl, which is 3336. Um, again, we make uh, 3336. It's really good on, really good on uh, gray leaf spot, good on dollar spot, and pretty good on brown patch. So there's a there's a ton of different fungicides that are good on all of these, at least the big three kind of that we've talked about. And then, um, but I know that there's a lot of people out there that like to use the granular fungicides as well. And I know that those aren't, there aren't as many options out there as far as granular fungicides go, but there are still pretty good options. Um, I'm just looking on doyourown.com mm -hmm. to see if Turney's on there and it is. It's a, it's in a big jug though. So I don't see it as a smaller one, but okay. yeah, that, no, that's, that's cool. That I know that's another piece of it is, you know, <laughs> how much a homeowner is going to buy to use on their right. maybe one acre lot at the most. And so they could have a jug for 10 years sometimes. So no, that's a big piece of it. Um, for sure. Do, uh, well, while we're talking about that, do, do these fungicides last that long if they're stored properly? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I've had, I've used fungicides after a decade and ha haven't had issues. I've used herbicides after a decade with no issues at all also, but I can tell you that the best practices would be to keep it in a cool place, uh, out of sunlight, you know, UV light can break down these, these molecules pretty quickly. High heat can cause issues as well. So I would try to store them in a cool, dry place. I think that, everything that has a shelf life it always says that same thing so same is true of fungicides and herbicides and insecticides it's just easy to justify buying a big, big expensive sure. bottle to the missus if i say it, it'll last me 10 years yeah <laughs> no doubt 
Chris, I'll let you take the intro into this next one since this is near and dear to your heart. No, it's near and dear to my heart because, yeah, uh, <laughs> I got crushed it? by it and I hate it. Uh, Pythium Blight. Uh, I just, I, it's near and dear to my heart because I just <laughs> overseeded on a 100% perennial ryegrass uh, spring overseed okay. and learned the hard way. Of, of what this is. So that's one of the cultivars and grass types that this is <clears throat> there for. But talk about it. How do we ID it? How do we prevent it? Um, and then I've got one that will be uh, probably asked about probably more commonly than the ones we've even talked about uh, okay. after this one before we wrap up. Right. So uh, Pythium blight and Pythium, there's a lot of different species or pathogens of Pythium. They can cause a, a foliar blight. They can cause a root rot. There's one called Pythium dysfunction that affects creeping bent grass more than anything on golf courses. But you mentioned perennial ryegrass, which can get absolutely crushed by Pythium blight. And this is one that you can, um, I've seen this on athletic fields that are maybe Kentucky bluegrass and ryegrass mixes where a turf manager has left in the evening, say 5 p.m., they left their job they came back in the morning at eight or nine and they're like, holy crap, what happened? And so this is one that overnight can really wipe out a turf stand if so the conditions scary. are right. Can confirm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you said that yours wasn't like a overseed. So it was new seedlings coming up, right? Uh, yeah. Yep. They were newer plants. And so even especially on newer plants, newer tender plants like that, where the humidity can be high. Maybe you've been watering to keep it well watered, all that kind of stuff. Um, we'll even coat seeds with uh, fungicides that can kill uh, this particular pathogen because it affects seedlings so so readily. So you mentioned ryegrass. Uh, Anu bluegrass is a big one. That's not one that we at least have in our lawns on purpose. But Pythium blight can really affect any turf species. It just so happens that ryegrass is, uh, for whatever reason, the main turf species that will see this effect more than anything. Same thing, this is another fungus, although it's a little bit different than all the other funguses or fungi that we've talked about so far. Pythium, like, um, like a few other fungi, is a water mold. And so it moves in water, it will produce spores and these spores Sometimes you'll see if, if you have an uh, outbreak of Pythium, if you have drainage going moving somewhere, this blight or this disease will move with the drainage. So it's moving with the water and can kind of move around in that way. So it's a water mold. And because it's a water mold, uh, a lot of the, fungi or the um, fungicides that we've talked about don't affect it at all. You have to use very specific fungicides for water molds. Not anything's just gonna go and kill Pythium uh, because of this. So the thing you're looking for for Pythium though is high heat and high humidity. And I know we said this before uh, for all the other diseases, but this one especially, if you have um, daytime temperatures that are above 85 degrees Fahrenheit and then night, nighttime temperatures that stay above 65 degrees Fahrenheit and you have three days straight of this plus high humidity and you have ryegrass and it's newly seeded ryegrass, high alert, high alert for sure. Uh, you might as well put a 100% guarantee on it. <laughs> okay. Actually. Okay. So that was for you. It's not always a hundred percent guarantee, but those are things that, um, you know, it's, it's that disease triangle all over again. Mm -hmm. So it really, if you had, a, if you had Kentucky bluegrass, you might not have seen this Pythium disease because it, that pathogen would have been present still but it doesn't affect other species in the same way it can affect ryegrass. However, just because you had ryegrass and not Kentucky bluegrass, it could have affected you in the same way, even though you had Kentucky bluegrass. It's just such a small balance in some of these different, um, some of these disease triangle things. And so anyway, that's, this is one that you really, I don't know, you can't like, um, we can do our best to forecast it. I mean, you could have looked at the weather and th thought, man, I have new ryegrass and, and it looks like it's going to be really hot. Even the nighttime temps are really hot, high humidity. Uh, often if we have thunderstorms that just have that cloud of humidity down, that can cause pythium outbreaks. Um, but this is one that I see it um, catch people off guard all the time. Mm -hmm. it, when you're in the transition zone, so say you're in Tennessee, 
it doesn't catch them off guard very much because they're always ready for it. But we don't see it often enough um, a little bit further north to always be ready for it. It can catch us off guard. And so um, if you do see it, see a little bit of, bit of it, you're lucky. This is one that can cause, again, you'll see patches of dead surf, turf. Sometimes they're sunken. They're sunken down like it has killed some patches and there's, it killed it so fast that it caused that turf to sink down in. And it will often look greasy, like mm -hmm. the turf will look, have that greasy look to it. Um, and it can be really, really quick. So if you catch it at that point where it hasn't killed your entire turf stand and you look into the forecast and it's going to stay humid and it's going to stay hot, then you, and it's a high commodity turf, like, like I said, if it's a, a sports field, you certainly want to make an application, but you can't just spray anything. There's certain products that kill these water molds and like a Zaxistrobin, it can kill some Pythium species, but for a curative application, there's a product called, um, um, Mephanaxum or whatever it's called. So Mephanaxum is one that's, um, subdue. And then there's one called Siozofamid. I'm blanking on mm. the, the trade name, but Siozofamid mm. is a newer one. That's a pretty good curative application. Um, Mephanaxum, like you mentioned, and then, um, Propamacarb is the other one. So those three, at, at least as curative applications, are pretty good to kind of stop it in its tracks. But you might have those at your disposal, but you, you'd have to go and buy it, and then you got to get it, and you got to mix it. And these things can happen so quickly that you might lose your chance to even make that application. Yeah. Right. You're not just going to the big box store and finding those. You're no, you're not. You're online and waiting days. And if you wait days, oh, boy. Yep. Yeah. It, well, and that happened to me last year uh because i still had ryegrass in there um that happened to me last year was closer to like i think it was about this time last year about june or july and <clears throat> yeah it took four days to get there so by the time that happened i had like eight spots okay there and it's not going away it's still yeah. there like even though you get rid of it it's it's a root thing so it's still there sure so then this i mean at least i had the product this time to control it where i saw the one spot i'm like nope immediately went to the garage and made an application and so it came it. back this year oh yeah yeah okay. but it's like my arch nemesis just just one of those things and andrew knows that too so yeah, it's a um, devastating one yeah but yeah between that and like phosphites and things like that i mean it's just a whole new world that i've learned about in the past right. 12 yeah. months so um yeah not fun but you can be prepared for it and that's a common theme is what i'm catching is you can be prepared for all of these um, in, in more of a preventative stance, if you really try to, which is, which is great news, um, for people who are learning and absorbing all of this information, right? It might take years to get this information down. Um, the one thing that all three of us likely witnessed this year, uh, as you mentioned, you're in Michigan, Andrew's in Michigan, I'm in Minnesota, snow mold came mm -hmm. rampant, uh, in the springtime and, it kind of depends on the winter that we have. We don't know what we're going to have in the fall, you know, going into the fall into the winter. But let's talk about snow mold because it is so common. Um, I've learned over my time, it's not necessarily something to really panic about, mm -hmm. but it is preventable. So I want to hear your take on it. Um, I, it. You can talk about IDing it, but I think people know what it looks like when they come out of spring. Looks like sure. a bunch of patches in their yard, but can you prevent it? Yeah. So um, snow mold, yeah, obviously it's one that we see further in the north. Snow mold, there's a couple different kinds of snow mold. There's pink snow mold, there's gray snow mold, there's speckled snow mold. Pink snow mold is probably the one that we're uh, probably going to see the most in a lawn setting. Gray snow mold, you have to have snow cover for you know, uh, 40 to 70 days to actually see it because it's only going to grow underneath snowpack. And sure. so if you have snow cover and, and sometimes you'll see this, if people, you know, live further North, they get a lot of snow and they're plowing snow into this big pile and that big pile takes forever to melt. Then you'll see maybe some gray snow mold underneath or even speckled snow mold under there. Pink snow mold needs zero gray, uh, zero snow cover. So it can just grow in, um, cooler temperatures. And it, it tends to just, like you said, you see these spots or patches of pink snow mold 
you come out in the spring before everything's really greened up and you'll see sometimes hence the name has the kind of this pink hue to it and so pink snow mold is again another fungus that it's not growing in high heat high humidity it does need some moisture to grow but it's growing throughout the throughout the winter so especially when we have these winters that settle down um, either early so say say we say we have some uh, a late fall we go into december january and it's still pretty um, warm. I think we had the, the, this this last summer, mm -hmm. or sorry, this last fall slash winter, and even the year before that. Or we have a harsh winter, and then it starts to cool down, but it just, we don't have snow cover. It's just kind of moist and cold. Snow mold can grow during, the, during those periods of time. I rarely see snow mold killing turf. It will look like it will have killed a bunch of patches, and maybe it will kill a few plants within those patches. But usually with a little bit of nitrogen and heat mostly, just to get some uh, growth, we see most of the turf, at least in, in lawn height turf, to kind of come out of that. I can tell you on a golf course, all the northern courses, so I'm a, again, I'm in Michigan, and especially the courses further north in Michigan, Every single one of them is spraying a preventative snow mold application on every fairway and every green every single year mm -hmm. because they don't want to guess which year is going to be devastating. Some years can be so devastating that they're just going to hedge their bets and spray a snow mold app every year. And how they do that is they spray, um, usually they spray a concoction of fungicides that includes three or even four different um, active ingredients together some contact, some uh, preventative that get into the plant, but some that just kind of sit on the plant and protect it. And they spray it as late into the fall as they poss possibly can. If they had their way, they would spray it right before a snowfall so that it lasts the longest. And so as that snow mold starts to grow, that um, preventative fungicide, that contact fungicide is there to kind of kill that inoculum as it begins to grow in the plant. And the longer that inoculum can last on the plant, so what can happen even is it doesn't snow, they spray, it doesn't snow for a long time after, they get a bunch of rainfall, it warms up, the turf grows out of it, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. That's when they have failures. And so the later they can make that application, the better. I would say for the normal homeowner, this is one where even golf courses, they're only spraying it to hedge their bets because one out of five years could be devastating where they lose a couple of fairways or greens or whatever. On a, on a home lawn, I would say it's maybe one out of 20 years that you might actually lose some turf and it might not be that much. And so it may not be a bet that you really need to hedge um, by making an application ever. But when you do see it, I think you can just, you know, go about your normal activities, wait for some heat to kind of warm up the turf. The turf will start kind of growing out of it. At that point, the if you see the symptoms, the the Fungus is, is kind of done growing. What's done is done. Wait till it grows out of it. Add a little nitrogen to help it grow out of it as temps warm up and just kind of wait it out. Love it. Hey, I want to get your opinion on one thing because I have snow mold and I've had it the last couple of years. Okay. Probably more than that. But it's only in my front lawn and it is where my septic system is <laughs> in my entire septic drain field. So here's my theory. Tell me if you agree or disagree. Um, the heat from my septic tank in the drain field actually melts like the bottom layer of the snow and this creates a ton of moisture that gets trapped under there. And so it's not just like a dry, you know, frozen snow. It's actually like creates more of a wet environment underneath the snow. And I feel like that's why, because I don't have it in my side or my back. It's only in my front where my septic system is. So I don't know. That's kind of how I'm justifying it. I'd love to get your take, though. That's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> I can't problems. say that I've ever heard that before. Yeah, um, it's, it's a shit problem. I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, so does the snow last longer in that area at all? Same no, turtle species, it, same everything for the most part? Yeah, same everything. It's just, um, I just think that it's heat. just warm. Like there's heat yeah. radiating from the ground more. And so the ground is, so the ground doesn't t technically freeze, I think, in a lot of those areas. Okay. Which I think that's what helps, you know, bring it on as well is that the ground is not frozen. 
Yeah, that's an interesting covered. thought. And it makes sense because it fits with the whole disease triangle thing. I mean, if everything gets so cold, that's the that's why gray snow mold, you know, you need some snow cover for it to grow. And that might be what you're seeing is that environment under there is just warm enough and not so cold that this fungus can actually grow and cause some issues. And so that's why gray snow mold, for instance, needs snow cover because it needs mm -hmm. some insulation and then you have heat coming from underneath the ground. So you, you need a very particular environment for it to grow. And so maybe it's what you're seeing is gray snow mold. And yeah. over that particular area, you're just getting the right environment, maybe the right nutrients too for it to really grow. <laughs> yeah, it, I, also, I have good grass up there because of it too. Yeah, I bet. But it sounds like I'll be the guy um, out there at Thanksgiving if there's no snow and it's bringing up preventative. <laughs> right. So. Well, hey, Aaron, this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much for coming back on uh, for a second time. Uh, the information that you have shared with us has taught us a ton. I'm sure our listeners are probably listening more than once to take notes because there's so much information jam-packed into these episodes. And it's just been, it's been really cool for us to have you on. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank your family for yeah. allowing you to step away. Um, but uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Lawn Feed Podcast. Uh, just a reminder to everybody to head over to thelawnfeed.com. Get that Lawn Feed swag. Uh, special code BRAD15 will get you 15% off your entire order at thelawnfeed.com. So uh, until the next time, guys, take care. See ya. Bye.